Welcome to Wednesday Wonders. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Welcome to Chronosphere Fiction. This is your host, Daniel French, reminding you that for a mere dollar a month, not only will you help us continue to create this podcast, but you will receive bonus episodes such as the story of Agapantha and the soon to come tales of Dire Rock Deep. Go to patreon.com slash chronosphere. And now, what you're all waiting for, Garbanzo! Yes, Chief? Set course full throttle for the Generation Z Bubbleverse. You got it, Chief. Here we go. Generation Z. Episode 1, Centenary Approaches, by Blake Benlin. Ninety-nine years have passed since the zombie outbreak. We join Kevin at his family home in Dead Zone 7, formerly the central coast of California. Hey Nick, you want to go out for a while? Can't, watching TV. You've been watching TV for like two weeks, nonstop. It's a marathon, I'm binge watching. Come on, the sun's out today. Nah, the heat makes me stink after a while. You can borrow some of my air fresheners if you want. Do you have pina colada? (laughs) All out, just pine. Bleh, pass. What the heck are you watching anyway? Days of our deaths. Yeesh. What? You'd seriously rather watch that trash than go out for a walk, get some fresh air? Trash? Hey, this show's got great character development. Dave was just about to marry Suzanne before Ricky objected on the grounds that he found her supposedly dead ex Donovan's head in her fridge. Which means legally they're still married, and now Donovan's head is about to tell all. (laughs) That's dumb. You're dumb. Why don't you just hang out with, what's his name, Greg? Greg's still visiting Dead Zone 12 with his family. He'll be gone till next Tuesday. Well, what about Walt? I called his house and they said he wandered off two days ago. Hasn't come back yet. Isn't answering the phone either. Uh Uh-oh. He's probably just out exploring the woods. Wish he took me with him. Hope he didn't get eaten by scavengers. Funny. Why don't you just go out on your own then? Because it's boring. I've probably walked over every inch of DZ7 like 27 times at this point. Some company would be nice. You can join me here on the couch if you want. (laughs) No thanks. Well, maybe Dad will go with you. He upstairs? Yeah, working on something, I think. Worth a shot. If you change your mind about days of our deaths, I'll be here. Yeah, I bet you will be. Yes! Ah, um, it's me. Can I come in? Sure. What are you doing? Oh, just working on the latest custom order from our anonymous friend over in Dead Zone 1. So he's got to be like a high-level politician or something, right? I don't know. Anonymity is very important to him. But he certainly throws money around like it's no big deal. So what is that exactly? Well, it's going to be a hat. A hat? That's right, with bulletproof lining. I'm just cutting out the Kevlar here. Bulletproof suits, fire-resistant shirts, bulletproof hat? Why doesn't this guy just go and get himself some armor or something, if he's so skittish? Yeah, not very subtle, huh? Not easy to move in either. And whatever this guy does, he doesn't clan around, that's for sure. Maybe he's a top government assassin. (laughs) I uh, seriously doubt that. Telling you, Dad, you should totally sell your designs to the military. They'd pay top dollar. Yeah, I don't, don't need that kind of money, number one. Number two, if they were at all interested in saving soldiers' skins, they wouldn't be shipping them to the east in the first place. Yeah, maybe you're right. Anyway, I was wondering if you wanted to get out for a little while. Maybe go to the beach? Oh, I'd love to, but I should really be here working on this. A prompt turnaround is very important to our friend. Another sizable rush order bonus is on its way. I thought you said the money wasn't important. Well, there's my reputation to think about, too. Besides, the beach, you know, last time I was there, I caught that sand flea infestation. I was picking them out of my teeth for a whole week. (laughs) We've got repellent. I don't know. Maybe another time, Kev. The beach, you know... 
A lot of memories. Memories? Yeah. Memories I eh, wouldn't care to revisit. You mean other than the sand fleas? That's right. Wait, you're talking about mom? Uh, well, you know, Kevin, it's just... I- Dad, it's been so long. I miss her too, but come on, it's been almost a century. Oh, I know. You don't have to remind me. Still counting. I tell you, it sure feels like a century. You can find somebody else, Dad. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, hey, I went on a couple dates with that one woman. Stacy? Yeah, that was two dates. Like 12 years ago. All right, listen, Kev, could we talk about this later, pal? <sighs> Whatever. Guess I'll just go out by myself again. Wow. Well, now, hey, you could still call, uh, what's his name, Greg? No. Uh, that sounded like Nick. What is it? They interrupted my show for this dumb breaking news thing. Ricky had just announced his unliving love for Suzanne and Donovan's head. Nick, we thought you were- Now, wait a minute. Turn it up. Huh? Turn it up. Reported this afternoon that significant progress in negotiations between living and undead delegations is finally being made. Ambassador to the Living, John Gorman, having spoken personally with Vice Counsel of the United Living Zones, said, quote, this could at last be the breakthrough we've been waiting for, unquote. He stated with cautious optimism that state-supervised tour groups of undead Americans may be allowed in living zones by the 100th anniversary of the transition, and additionally that mutual barriers to interzonal trade will be lifted pending further negotiations. President Knox, in a public address from the White House, celebrated this as, quote, an historic step toward cooperation and coexistence between our peoples, unquote. We as undead Americans, he said, can be proud of the example of brotherhood we've set on this day, unquote. And in other news, hmm. CFDA awards now that's took place something. in New York this year, and there were several... Meanwhile, in Living Zone 4, formerly the Sierra Nevada region of California... Mom! George! I'm back! <coughs> Mom? You doing all right? I'm fine. I'm just a bit feverish. <coughs> You're not looking so good. It just sounds worse than it is. <coughs> did the generator go out again? What? Um, oh, I guess it did. Where's George? Um, <coughs> out, I think. So here, I... No, don't get any closer, please. I don't want you to get this, honey. <coughs> it's just the flu, Mom. I've had it before. You'll beat it. Yes, of course, honey. I just have to get through the worst of it. <coughs> anyway, here. I've been out gathering for a few hours. Found some more blackberries in the usual spot. Lots of pine nuts, miner's lettuce. There were even some raspberries on the other side of the creek. Samantha, you know you shouldn't be crossing the creek. I know, I know. But there was nobody around, and I could see them right across. Anything in the dead zone could be carrying that virus, Sam. We've had stuff from across the creek before, and it's never hurt us. It's too risky. No more venturing across the creek. It's just too easy to get infected. Fine, whatever. Anyway, everything here should last us for a couple more days. Longer if George is out there hunting for some meat. <coughs> Honey. <coughs> yeah? Oh, do you mind? Could you make me some of that pine needle tea? I think it'll help my throat. <coughs> of course, Mom. Let me just get a fire going out front. Oh, thank you, sweetie. Uh, just be careful. <coughs> <coughs> if you need anything else, just call. <coughs> What are you doing? Oh, God, you scared me, George. I was going to brew some tea for Mom. She isn't doing well. Put it out. What? I said, put it out. Smoke's conspicuous. Why? What are we hiding from? I don't have to remind you. Hey! Make your tea inside. Can't. Generator's out. I'll get it going in a minute. Hey, Leanne! Coming! So where have you been? Can't you tell? Hunting? You could say that. Didn't catch anything. Wasn't trying to. Here I am. Oh, hey, Samantha. Hi, Leanne. Hey, babe. So, what were you hunting for? Oh, 
Nothing alive. Wait, you mean... Found a couple of kid zombies wandering around on our side. Pretty deep in, too. Must have gotten lost. What did you do? <laughs> My duty. This is our zone. Play a few holes in them. Lit them up. But they were just kids. No, that's what they look like. Easy to forget they got 200 years between them. They knew where they were. You gotta wise up about zombie trash, sis. If just one of them so much as his pisses in the wrong spot, we could all be turned in no time. What did they look like? Mm, well, one had an eyeball dangling out of its socket. The other was missing its jaw. And both of them had their maggot-ridden guts hanging out of their eviscerated stomachs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then when they saw us, they made an inhuman growl and lunged at us. No, they didn't. How would you know? You don't know how lucky you are that you've never seen one. They're fucking abominations. Grow task. We did those little shits a favor. Better dead than undead. You don't think they have families, do you? <sighs> God, you're stupid, Sam. They're not people. They're... they're creatures. They're more like animals than like us. They'd tear you apart and eat you as fast as anything. This is the third time this month a patrol caught them on our side. They're getting bolder, more aggressive. It's still not enough for them. All that they took from the living? Yeah. You know, Sam, every dead zone used to belong to the living. This world used to be one big living zone before they came and almost wiped us out. They'd like to finish us off, too. They sure as hell would. That's why you gotta enlist in the lifeguard. Join the cause. You learn how to shoot, go on patrols, important stuff. And they'll put your thinking right about those dead-eyed bastards. I thought I wasn't old enough. They lowered the minimum age. And not just here, apparently. All over the ULZ. It's a whole recruitment drive. They're gearing up for something big. I wouldn't have to kill any zombies, would I? Well, it's not really killing, is it? Killing them's the fun part. Seriously. Sometimes you sound like a straight-up zombie sympathizer. Well... I'd consider joining, but someone's got to be here to take care of Mom while she gets over the flu. Look, Samantha, that's not the flu she's got. It's not? No, it's not. Well, then what is it? <sighs> it's called consumption. She knows that's what it is. She just didn't want to tell you. Consumption? It's incurable. Wait, wait. You're saying... There's no way to treat it. I've seen it before. She's just going to get worse and worse. And it'll be winter soon. No way she's coming back from that. But, but you're just, you're not going to just give up on her, are you? After a point, we're just wasting food and water and heat. Putting off the inevitable. It's going to be a rough winter. We'll need to conserve resources for the living, Samantha. But, but I, no. Oh, I know it's hard. It's a hard life, Sam. But cheer up. We haven't lost her yet. And when we do, the lifeguards are the best family you could ask for. Oh, uh, so, how'd the foraging go? Fine. The food's inside. Great. I'm starving. I, uh, I think I'll just stay out here for a while. Suit yourself. We now find ourselves in Dead Zone 1, formerly Washington, D.C., currently home to President Knox, leader of the United Dead Zones of America. The man himself sits behind his desk in the Oval Office. Thank you. No, I drafted it myself personally. Yes, naturally, I, well, I, I, I wouldn't go that far, but... Come in. Oh, hello, dear. No, it's it's Charlotte. Just walked in. W what's the matter, love? Mark, when you've got a free minute, we've got to talk. It's important. Im important? It's about Marie. Uh, I'm all ears. Who was that on the phone? Oh, just the vice president. Nothing that can't wait. But what's the matter with our daughter? It's, it's very strange. Go on. It's going to sound very odd, I know, but I wouldn't barge in on you like this if I didn't believe it myself and if it weren't so significant. Tell me, for God's sakes. It was just a thought at first, a suspicion, so I started paying closer attention and 
I think. Yes. I think she might have grown. Grown, grown, you say? I know. It sounds ridiculous, and it's not very much. But believe me, after 99 years, I've come to know her. Her exact dimensions, her height, her weight. And I swear, ever so slightly, but surely nonetheless, they're starting to change. Mark, I see it. I feel it. When I, when I pick her up, it's unmistakable. It. And has anyone else noticed this? I spoke with her nurse just the other day, and she told me she hadn't wanted to say anything for fear of sounding crazy. And there's more. What do you mean there's more? I'm telling you this now because, well, you remember when she skinned her knee last week? Yes. That scab. Now it only looks like a bruise. Wait, you're saying her blemish has healed? It's like nothing I've ever seen. Not since we were alive, that is. That's, that's more than just fantastical. It's, it's positively miraculous. I know. I'm so, so confused. But you're, you're absolutely sure of this. Mark, you know I am. I, I believe you, but I hardly even know what to say, what to think. I think we need to bring it to a doctor right away. I agree, but... We also need to keep quiet about this, for, for now at least, until we have a better understanding of what's going mm. on. Hmm, I must confess, I'm a bit scared for her. I completely understand. That's why we have to make sure whatever it is that's, that's happening to Marie, that, that it stays strictly a family matter for the time being, not a public one. No one else knows but a nurse, right? No one I know of. If you didn't notice, I can't imagine anyone else would have. Speak to her nurse again. Make sure she understands the gravity of the situation, if she doesn't already. Find out who else she's told, if anyone. Don't tell anyone else. All right. What should I tell Marie? Tell her... Tell her we just want to make sure she's okay. Mr. President, we have... Oh. I'm not interrupting something important, am I? Not at all. We were just discussing the decor we'd like for our state dinner with the Prime Minister of the Undead Republic of Ireland next week. What's the trouble? I don't mean to blow the matter at hand out of proportion, but some might say we are faced with a national emergency of sorts. Now, I'm not among them, a but... A national emergency? Yes, sir. You're wanted at the Pentagon immediately. Well, obviously this can't wait. No. Dear, if you could attend to what we discussed while uh, we were... Of course. No time to waste. Shall we? Shortly thereafter, in the war room. Gentlemen, please. We are grateful to President Knox for joining us on such short notice. Pressing hardly does justice to the magnitude of the circumstances. Noted. Now, could you please inform me what exactly is amiss, General? Certainly, sir. If you'll just direct your attention to the pictures on the screen, sir. Our satellites captured these images over the course of the past week. The highlighted masses of shapes along the red lines are military encampments. Divisions of these so-called lifeguards, their centralized paramilitary force used for civil policing and national defense, amassed along the borders between the living and dead zones across the continent. This buildup has been alarmingly hasty, undoubtedly planned well in advance. And I must regard this, Mr. President, as an act of preparation anticipating full-scale hostilities. War, in short. Mr. President, I must point out that this is no invasion. The guards, as you can see, have respected the integrity of our rightful lands. Can the living not occupy their own? Surely where would a force intended for the defense of a nation better reside than at the borders of that nation? Would we not do the same had we adequate numbers at our disposal? Precisely why the possibility of aggressions on the continent is so deeply concerning... Over 90% of our military forces are presently deployed overseas, actively engaged in combat. We've got nothing but reserves. Could any of our armies be withdrawn if necessary? Not without risking considerable losses on any front, as things now stand. The situations in Asia and Africa are delicate. Still, even with the better part of the armed forces in use, the living can hardly have mustered a force capable of making any substantial territorial gains in short time. They're poorly trained, disorganized, poorly provisioned. Sources tell us these lifeguards are well-armed. Assault rifles, shotguns. Uh, 
Of course, they've got guns. Many of them must hunt for their food in the abysmal conditions they've been consigned to. They aren't to be blamed for that. And they're so few in number. A much higher ratio of the living are in arms than the dead. The society of the living is virtually militarized. And they've got more than guns. Grenades, artillery, even tanks, which they've attempted to conceal from reconnaissance unsuccessfully. Their numbers are difficult to estimate, but after all, they're always growing, given that they've got a birth rate. And practically nothing stands between them and our population. I need hardly remind you, Mr. President, of the countless border incidents for decades past. The incursions, the disappearances, the full-on raids... We're showing all the symptoms of complacence. Those were isolated incidents that General Adams is referring to. The work of a few renegades. Nothing that can fairly be pinned on the consul or consulate of the United Living Zones of America or its citizens. As tempting as it may be to scapegoat all the living for the actions of their worst. We can't allow this idle speculation on impending doom dictate the future of our policy toward the living, can we? Certainly not today of all days. Now that Americans living and dead seem ready at last to join hands in understanding once again. Now that the wounds are starting to heal. The president's aides' love and sympathy for the living is touching, but my allegiance lies solely with the American dead and their well-being. And what good would it do them to make war with us, hmm? It's a great deal harder for them to kill us than it is for us to kill them. There are more of us. We can turn them at will. Open conflict would mean their extinction. Our government has been a more effective advocate, nay, warrior, for the basic right of the living on soil both domestic and foreign than any other since the outbreak took place. We've sacrificed countless souls for them. An attack would make no sense whatsoever. General Adams, what exactly is it you proposing? I advise that we pair all available units with every auxiliary we can muster. Militias, police forces, any armed, organized bodies ready to strike within days and launch a preemptive assault, disabling key elements of their army and vastly reducing the possible damage a first strike on their part could inflict. And then what? Then? I would think then we negotiate a ceasefire and hammer out a peace on our terms that provides for the safety of our people, but also one that allows for the continuation of the lessening of interzonal tensions. And why would they negotiate after we slaughter them unprovoked? It took a century to win their trust. It will take a millennia to win it back if we lose it now. And all the undead who died in foreign fields for the living will have died in vain. If they mean to make war on us, we'll never find ourselves in a more advantageous position than the one we now occupy. It could make a difference of millions of undead lives, sir. Hmm. You two both make compelling arguments. General Adams, what you have brought to my attention is captivating, unnerving, and I trust you implicitly. Thank you, sir. However... I also trust the representatives of the ULZ, and I will not be the one to abruptly disrupt decades of diplomatic efforts that are now proving to be the best hope for finally overcoming years of prejudice and misunderstanding between the zones. If they say they're ready to bridge the gap, that's not a chance I'm going to throw away. There will be no preemptive assault, but I want our continental forces bolstered in the months to come so that nothing catches us off guard. And I want you, Adams, to make those arrangements right away. Gladly, sir. And Danton. Yes, sir. I want you to meet with the council in Living Zone 1, secretly, and seek a detailed explanation of the buildup along the borders. If he doesn't trust us, I want to know. In the meantime, negotiations will continue on the exchange programs and trade, and publicly we will tout our progress. Don't forget, the centenary of the transition will be here soon. How we choose to commemorate it will live on in the memories of the living and dead alike for ages. Gentlemen, thank you all for your time. A secret laboratory beneath Living Zone 1, formerly Brooklyn. Okay, <laughs> steady. All right, that's enough. Nothing. No effect. Too much dilution? No, wait. Wait a minute. Schneider, a pulse. My god. It's... it's alive. Quick. We've got to record the time and the measurement of... Wait, what's going on? Its heart rate is spiking. No, no, no. It's going to... Damn it. God damn it. Dead. Undead or... No. Just dead. Fucking hell. Date, October 25th, year 99. Time, 1436. Number 17 receiving serum 39. Result. Promising start. 
Blood flow restored after several seconds, causing great pain to the specimen. Pulse continued to accelerate until death. Conclusion. Too strong a concentration? Too much? Administered to... I've got some conclusions. Things that die aren't supposed to come back. Well, they aren't supposed to walk and talk either. Yes, thank you, Dr. Whitney. They're going to nail our asses to the goddamn wall. They should know by now this is pure trial and error. We've got such primitive tools to work with. How can we reverse the effects of the syndrome if we can't even properly study it? That's my point. They're asking us to cure death with a few test tubes and Bunsen burners. It's going to take time. Quite some time. Maybe so. More time than we've got. Well, they can't exactly rush us. I didn't mean more time from them. I meant at this rate, it'd take lifetimes to accomplish what they're asking. I put in a request last month for a legitimate pre-transition bioscience literature, and they gave me magazines. I asked for post-transition documents on the condition of symptomology, and they gave me a living with your undead identity self-help pamphlet. We wasted a whole week just waiting to be restocked with rubber gloves. It might save us years if they simply allowed us to speak with a zombie who had formal biochemical training before the outbreak, or if we had real equipment with real informational resources. But instead, we're a pair of blind men aiming for a bullseye. Calm down, Schneider. Wasn't today's trial encouraging enough? It's miles off from where they want. It's a step in the right direction. Or a step towards a fatal plummet. Who's to say? What are you talking about? Have you ever thought about what they do if and when they get the vaccine? You think then we'll be able to return above ground? No, they'll put us in the ground is what they'll do. Something so sensitive, they wouldn't want to take the risk of information getting out. But you wouldn't let it get out, would you, Dr. Schneider? Lars! You shouldn't be barging in here unannounced. For all you knew, we could have been working directly with the syndrome. You might have exposed yourself. For all I knew? Seems you've got some preconceived notions of how much I know. Shouldn't I? You wouldn't. If you knew about the camera. Camera? <laughs> I thought you eggheads were here because you're smart. You couldn't have guessed. But don't think we're throwing you in front of the firing squad just yet. No, today I just want there to be a complete understanding between us. What do you call these things again? It's a possum. Looks fairly dead. It is. Recently dead. Oh, really? It was our most successful trial yet. Successful? We managed to revive its circulatory function for a few seconds. Then it died. Hardly what I'd call success. It's the best we've done. It's not good enough. Do you know what kind of money is being funneled into this project? You can't simply buy a cure. You have no idea how difficult this is, or maybe you do if you've been spying on us. Sadly, I've got more important things to do than watch asshole TV. We've got people for that. Shame. Then I'll have to repeat just what we need to make this process. You're not getting anything more. There are big going-ons above, and the man upstairs can't allocate any more money to your fruitless experimenting. What are you saying? You're shutting us down? Oh, no. Certainly not. Actually, I came here to let you fellas know this project is being fast-tracked. You mean to say... He wants the vaccine within a month. But that's insane. Do you think... Do we even know... Listen... We're not anywhere near finished. We've had no success with the possums that were undead for longer than even a couple of weeks. They'll go from undead to dead almost instantly. The one on the table there was given the zombie syndrome just yesterday, and we can't even resurrect that for more than a few seconds. You can't just comprehend the reality of it. Reviving a body that's been dead for a decade, it's, it's almost inconceivable, and we haven't even advanced beyond animal trials yet. That's about to change. Inside of a week, you're going to begin trials on zombie humans. What? Zombie humans? Yes. He needs that vaccine within a month. The sooner the better. 30 days is all you have. Where, where will you get the zombie? Don't worry about it. Leave that to us. What you should be worried about is what happens to you two if you haven't finished your task in a month. Well, I suppose you guys have your work cut out for you. I'll get out of your way. You can get back to it. And don't forget, we're watching.
Kevin is Will Gear. Nick is Justin Vincent. Kevin's dad is Warren Clark. The news anchor is Deborah Crystalball. Samantha is Deborah Crystalball. Sam's mom is Kathy Lieberman. George is Dean Garcia. Leanne is Dr. Michelle Booz making her voice acting debut. President Knox is Van Riker. Charlotte is Deborah Crystalball. Danton is Zach Macias. General Adams is Warren Clark. Dr. Schneider is Rod Diaz. Dr. Whitney is Antonio D'Annunzio. And Lars is Daniel French. Production and sound design is by Daniel French at Fishbonius Sound Design. Please support Chronosphere Fiction at patreon.com slash chronosphere or on our Podbean site. Email us via chronospherefiction at cox.net, C-O-X. Our Twitter is chronosphere, capital F-I-1. Hey everybody, we are the Derailers, Goobs, Ripkin, and Jenny Bean, and you can join us once every week for a brand new derailment. It includes sidetracking, randomness, we just can't stay on topic. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the Derailers. And please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, and also on YouTube. Derailers! The Lisp Game is a conversational improv game. Each of our panel members has a list of topics and or phrases that were drawn from the chicken hat. Their goal is to sneak those topics and phrases into the conversation with a tangent. Another member of the panel can call you out saying that's on your list. If they're right, they get a point. If you bluffed or if they're just wrong, you get a point. Catch The Lisp Game wherever you listen to podcasts. And that's going to wrap it up for this voyage on Chronosphere Fiction. Garbanzo's going to set course for the Gafgarn universe as we get ready to bring you Chapter 7 of Gafgarn, the Eternally Unfurnished. In the meantime, keep your cosmos clean. Thank you for listening to Wednesday Wonders right here on the Mutual Audio Network. Please consider subscribing to other days of the Mutual feeds, including Monday Matinee for classic live and theatrical audio plays, Tuesday Terrors for horror audio drama, Thursday Thrillers for action, adventure, mystery, and crime drama, Friday Follies, our end-of-the-week comedy series, Saturday Story Circle for kids and families alike, and Sunday Showcase, bringing you the very newest in audio releases for the week from our United Artists of Audio, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Drama Network, where we listen and imagine together.